So story and UI. Um, the story system is our system for creating cutscenes um, in the level editor. So animated scenes inside uh, that are created inside the level editor. Uh, so they typically involve multiple units, uh, multiple entities, and so on. And note that this is distinct from the character animation system that I've already talked about. Uh, for the character animation systems, the, you typically create the animations in a, an external DCC tool, and then you're interested in blending them together in using state machine graphs and so on. But this is used for drive, and, and, and they also drive only a single unit. Uh, whereas here we are creating a cutscene with multiple units involved and want to control them in, in various ways. And we call this a story. Uh, and a story consists of curves and events. And a curve is just a set of time value pairs that drives some specific target in the level. So that could be either a node in a unit, like we might move a unit around or move a specific node in the unit around, like the unit's head, turn the unit's head, and so on. Uh, it might also be a unit property. So for example, a tint color for a material could be driven by a curve or an entity property. Uh, so some kind of target. And, and you can create multiple curves in a story to drive multiple targets. Uh, in addition to these key value pairs and a target, the curve also has some settings, uh, an interpolation setting to specify if we, if we use linear interpolation or cubic interpolation or, or how, the, how we should interpolate between the curve keys. And also settings for the endpoints, how the, how the curve should be, behave when it's evaluated beyond the range of the keys, like should the should the curve repeat itself? Should it loop back and forth, sort of in a ping pong way? Uh, or should it just stop and clamp to the end value? So there are a bunch of different options uh, that can be specified for the curve. Uh, and then there are events. Events are just things that happen. Uh, they are identified by a name and a list of uh, time indices when this event occurs. So events will typically be used to drive other actions that aren't directly controllable from the story. For example, uh, you might have some interaction with the gameplay layer. So for example, one event might, might award a player 10 points or forever or whatever it might be, or, or it might play a sound like a footstep sound because we don't have, we don't have any sound playback integrated uh, into the story system itself, but that can all be driven by events. Um, so this is all, no, this is not the right one, this is all defined in a, all these things are defined in a types file that specifies the types of curve interpolation, the behavior at the endpoints, the keys, There's, this is just all the data structures, what the target can be, unit node, unit property, or entity property, and so on. And the player for playing back stories is not that complicated either. It has basic functions for playing a story, specify the level, you specify the resource, the compiled story resource, and the list of units that it should, should play on. Um, then you can stop it, control the time, control the speed, and so on, typical playback actions. So one kind of interesting thing to note with the story system is that on the engine side, the story system is not that complicated. It's, I, I would guess in total, maybe a thousand lines of code or, or something like that. It's not complicated at all. But if you look at the editor side, the story system is quite complicated. Uh, because you need all these curve editors for editing curve and you want, want 
editor, you want like controls for adding new curves, controls for, for controlling the gradients of the curve, specifying the interpolation, this behavior of the endpoint, and so on. And I mean, that's just for the UI. Then you need the, the interaction the interaction with the viewport like wh when you preview when you drag the slider you want to preview what happens uh, inside the level uh, but of course what what you how you move the how you move the units around in sort of the story at a specific time shouldn't affect the position the units are are positioned in the level so you have to sort of in just sort of enter a special story mode when you're editing a story uh, where the positions are, are driven by the story, but doesn't really affect their their base positions in the level, uh, and that be, that sort of state management becomes complicated. So, the story system is a pretty typical example of a system that is pretty simple on the end inside, but when you get to create an editor for it, that becomes a, a really, really, a really, really big task. Uh, and there are other situations where, where that kind of thing things occurs too. It's just something that's interesting to note that that those situations can occur. Simple, simple, simple on the or pretty simple at least on the ending side, but big big deal on the on the editor side. Um, the curve targets for stories um, can either be Nodes, they typically look something like this. So they specify an index of a unit, the node that we should move, uh, that we are affecting position, and that we are, this, this curve controls the x value of the position. And this index then gets mapped to an actual unit when we're playing the story. Uh, we can't store the actual unit in the resource, of course, because we can't store the unit references aren't live at that point. So that's why you pass in a list of units when you're playing the story. That list of units get mapped uh, to the indexes in the story. And it looks the same way when for driving entity parameters too. Uh, for units, we expose the values you can control from the, from the story tool are position, scale, and rotation for all the nodes in the unit. Uh, if the unit has cameras, you can drive their field of view, near range, and far range. If the unit has lights, you can drive their color, intensity, and angle. And for uh, if there's meshes in the unit, you can drive the material properties of the mesher, of the meshes, and so on. And there's a file called unit properties CPP that does this mapping, and it has IDs for all of these things that we control, can control, and it matches that against what this what comes in from the uh, from the story and make sure that it's applied in the right way. Um, for the entity system, you can control pretty much everything. So because we have a generic property interface for entities. Uh, so all these sort of settings for any entity component is exposed as properties. And the, uh, the story layer can drive any of those properties. So this, this again sh shows a bit of an advantage of the entity system where we have this generic interface we it's quite easy to expose everything whereas for in the unit system we sort of have to hand expose everything that we want to support and and not everything is supported for example you can't drive physics values here you can't like uh, you can't drive the mass of a physics actor in the unit for instance so this shows one of the advantages of having the entity system um, so that's really all I have to say about the story. As I said, it's not very complicated on the engine side. Really complicated on the on the editor side. Uh, our UI system, we have in the engine we have a simple system for for driving uh, game UIs, engine UIs. We also have a scale form plugin which you could use instead if you if you want to use scale form. I'm not gonna go into that. I'm not going to describe, I'm not talk, in this walkthrough, I'm not talking about the different kinds of plugins we have, WISE and, and Scaleform and stuff like that, navigation at all. I'm just going through the, uh, the core code. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the simple system that we have in the engine. Um, in the simple system, on the low level, it's, it represents a GUI object 
uh, with just a small set of values, an ID that uniquely identifies an object, which might be a rectangle, a picture, a piece of text, and so on. A layer, which is used for sorting, uh, so that we sort, um, uh, you can specify the order in which UI elements should appear. Uh, material, which specifies the texture, for instance, if this is a picture element. And then just a list of vertices, and that's just vertex data. So position, UV coordinates, um, color uh, for, for the vertices that make up this object. And we have a bunch of draw functions for, for drawing things in the UI. Um, that look like this. Uh, let's see here. Draw a rect, for instance, and you specify a, a UI rect. And uh, drawing a bitmap, you specify you a bitmap, and so on. And all of all what these things do, if you go to the code for one of these things, let's draw rect, for instance. All it does is that it creates these vertices. In the case of rect, it's um, six vertices, and it assigns them the proper color, UV, and normal, and positions uh, to create this object. And that's, that's what all of these uh, draw functions do. They create this uh, sort of low level. So from this high level representation that is passed in, this GUI rect struct, which looks like this, well, it inherits from GUI objects, so it's just position, size, layer, color. Uh, so from this high level representation, it creates this low level representation with just ID layer, material, and, and vertices. Um, and so we handle all of this the same way. Um, UIs can live both in either in screen space or in world space, so you can put the UI anywhere in the world and sort of walk around it, or you can have it on screen, depending on what you want. It's the same system that runs, runs both. Uh, we can also run the UI in two different modes, which we call immediate and deferred. And the difference is really, in the implementation, it's a real simple difference. The only difference is that in, if you're running in immediate mode, all the UI objects are deleted every frame. So, uh, oh, sorry. So, in uh, when you create, uh, uh, so if you see, for, for each UI object, we kind of have three functions. We have a function that creates the object and returns an ID uh, representing that object. Then we have an update function that takes that ID and updates its coordinates, uh, updates its definition, and then we have a destroy function that destroys the object. So in, in immediate mode, the destroy function is called automatically at the end of any, every frame. All these objects are deleted. And this means that you, if you want an, a GUI object to continue to appear, you have to redraw it every frame. So every frame you have to call draw for all the things that you want to show. And in deferred mode, uh, UI objects persist until they're explicitly destroyed. So in deferred mode, you would call the create function to create the object, then you would call update later to move it around, and when you're done with it, uh, you would call destroy manually. So, and these are kind of, these kind of modes, different programmers prefer different modes. I mean, there's this, uh, Deferred used to be the standard for everything, and then there was this um, immediate GUI revolution where a lot of people started using immediate mode. But some pe people have different preferences, and it's kind of nice that we can support both of these in the same system using a very simple mechanism for doing so. Um, the drawing of GUI objects happens on the, on the render thread, like all drawing. So, so these draw, update, destroy messages for, for creating these 
which is called create maybe rather than draw uh, for creating these creating updating and destroying these ui objects they all post messages to be processed by the render thread so they take this low level data representing the gui object and they post that down to the render thread uh, the render thread in turn batches the data by layer and material uh, and then and that is you that is done in order to reduce the draw call count uh, because once we batch the data we can then draw it with we can draw each batch with a single draw call uh, so uh, so when it when we call an update uh, the, and when we call update for a particular ui object we'll do a lookup the render thread will do a lookup on the id find the position of that object in the batch and update it or move it to a different batch if it needs to be moved because the layer or material of the object changed. Uh, so it's really a quite simple system, but, uh, but quite also powerful. Uh, you can do most kinds of things to the things you want to do with it. Um, one thing to note, like for future possible improvements of this system, is that we could potentially use more aggressive batching. Currently, each layer and each separate layer and separate material uh, will get its own batch, which might be kind of costly if you have if you have a UI with lots of different materials, lots of different textures, and lots of different layers, and you get a huge number of draw calls. So you could get rid of that by using texture atlases to reduce the number of materials. Currently, we don't have any automatic atlasing system. So if you want to use atlases right now, you could do it, but you have to sort of create the atlas textures manually and then specify the right UV coordinates to use, to use the right sub, sub part of the texture. But maybe we could add some kind of Texture atlasing system to this, maybe even a dynamically generated atlas in order to to improve the efficiency of this. And we could also get rid of this layer batching, perhaps by by instead sorting uh, sorting the vertices in the batches by the layer. So we still get the right draw order, but we don't have to do separate separate draw calls for each batch. And if we if you combine both these techniques aggressively, we should be able to get down uh, to a single draw call for drawing the entire UI, which could be interesting. Um, yeah, so that's all I had on the UI. Any questions on either of these topics, story or the UI? All right, if not, I'll see you tomorrow. I have, I have only one more lecture planned in, in this series, and that's for tomorrow when I talk about multiplayer and our, our networking and multiplayer system, which is kind of a bit, bit a big topic that, that I'm a bit scared of, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, but then I plan also to, to mon on Monday to do sort of a uh, question and answer session so if you have any question anything you think of that 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 you've seen earlier in this or or any any other questions you might have just send them to me and i'll i'll put them all in a uh, i'll put them all in a single document and try to go through them in a screencast on monday if i get enough questions if i don't get any questions at all i'll, I'll just skip it most likely um, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.